All right, I think it's a good time to get started. I'll continue letting people um, join us. So I think, welcome everybody this morning. It's nice to have some familiar faces who've joined us for all the webinars and to see a lot of new names. We're excited to get started. Um, I'm gonna just introduce Doreen and then I'm gonna hand over straight to Doreen. So Doreen is a clinical psychologist. She currently practices in Belleville and she's just moved over to private practice. Um, after being in the public sector for 10 years. Um, she works with all sorts of different clients and she has a huge passion for empowering people and giving people the, the tools to um, just live their best lives. So Doreen's gonna talk to us about a very important topic today and I'm gonna hand over to you, Doreen. Thank you, Tony. I'm so excited this morning. I cannot believe I see lots of uh, familiar faces and logos. Um, yeah, but I'm just really excited to have this opportunity. So thank you for joining. Um, please share on the chat screen, you know, where you're from. It's always interesting to see which part of the country people are from. Um, we need to connect, especially now. Okay, so let me just share my screen. Okay, Tony, you just need to enable. I've enabled it now. Just share. check if it's gone green at the bottom there. I have enabled it now. Okay, yes. Yeah, it's perfect. Right. Okay. Right, can everyone see it? Is it up and running? Okay, fantastic. Okay, so let's get started. Okay, so I always like starting my talks with a quote. So this one is, when I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant, I could hardly stand to have the old man around. But when I got to be 21, I was astonished at how much he had learned in seven years. And I think this for me is kind of what our teenagers are like. They think they know everything. And I want you to keep this in mind um, as we go through the talk. So what we're going to cover today is um, our teens developmental stages, the reasons why our teenagers might be struggling, especially now, and then practical tips on supporting our teens for which you actually are here. Um, I want you to keep in mind that we are all human, so there might be many things that you also feel that you can relate to in this regard. Um, okay, so developmental stages. So developmentally, we divide adolescence into three stages, early, early adolescence, middle adolescence, and then late adolescence. And it's important because your teen in that's 13 years old won't be the same as a teen that's 19 years old. And we need to take those developmental stages into account. So if we just quickly go through the different cate categories, um, sorry, I'm just putting, just seeing lots of people here. I just wanna focus on the screen, okay? So with regards to their body, obviously we know that this rap rapid growth and maturing of the bodies, the sexual characteristics that develop. So that is one of the categories that teenagers develop in. Um, with regards to their brain, we know that the brain matures, especially the, especially the prefrontal cortex where planning is situated and um, decision-making. So, and they are in, and this influence their ability to uh, solve social problems and also to solve skill or, or their problem solving skills. The next one is cognition. When our teenagers are st still in their early teens, their thinking is very concrete, which makes that they are unable to really know what the actions of their behavior would be. And I think we see that in their behavior. They cannot really predict what's going to happen in the future if I do X, Y, and Z. In the later teens, you know, that development has taken place and they're more, more able to predict accurately what consequences would be. With regards to psychosocial and um, psychological development, they see themselves in relation to others. That's also why you would very often see your teen comparing, well, this friend has better clothes than me, or, you know, his mom and dad does X, Y, and Z. So it's really part of their developmental process. There's frequent mood changes. I think all parents can relate to the ups and downs that our teens experience. 
and they are dreamy and they think they are powerful. They think they are going to take over the world. This is also a time when they experiment. They experiment with drugs, sex, you know, anything that, that kind of makes them curious. They would go in an experiment um, during this stage. With regards to family, they are definitely trying to shift rules and to push the boundaries. Uh, there's an interplay between being dependent on our family, but also having that independence. So they really, really struggle with authority. And you can imagine now being in lockdown, that is a really big kind of, I almost want to say, um, difficulty point between parents and, and children. And at the later teens, the relationship with a parent also gets redefined as a more kind of adult to adult relationship rather than child parent relationship per se. The peer group, so important for their development. So it determines their behavior. It also influences their values and they're more, more likely to talk to their peers than they are to talk to their parents. So if you feel like you've lost your little boy or your little girl, they don't want to talk to you anymore. This is exactly why. Because they are in the developmental phase where they, their peers, their friends, they talk to them. And then the last one, sexuality. So self it moves from self-exploration when they are still early teens to more mutual um, sexual relations. So in a nutshell, this is where we sit, or this is the developmental stages of a teenager. Um, now I've highlighted two, um, you know, two sections for this morning, two sections that I feel is really important to take into account during the pandemic and during lockdown. Because if you think about it, they are taken away from their peers. They don't go to school. There's no sports events. They cannot have parties. And this is extremely difficult for our teenagers. Um, the, the patients I see in, in the practice, they really struggle because, you know, they also feel that they're missing out so much. There's kind of, um, you know, events and sporting events and just, um, just a disappointment and not being able to sit with their peers in a little circle or do something with them um, and just relate to each other. And we all know that doing things online is not the same. And then the family section, of course, now there's, um, you spend all of the time with your family and really doesn't matter whether you have the best family in the world. If you spend too much time together, there is going to be conflict and that makes it extremely challenging. So just zooming in, this is everything that I said before. So family is, is difficult because they struggle for their independence and they also struggle with authority and now everything is intensified in this family structure and the family home and with regards to their peer group of course friendships are very important and it's so important for their social development so there's nowhere to go there's no movement for them with regards to their social engagement okay so that just sets the stage um, to understand our teenagers a little bit better. Now, if we move along to reasons why our teenagers might be struggling. Now, this is so important um, because, I th as I said previously, our teenagers are just the little humans. So, you'll see that as we go through why they might be struggling, you will also see yourself as a parent or as a you know, teacher or tutor. you also see yourself in many of these reasons. Um, so maybe um, think about how it has an implication on your life as well. And by no means is this an extensive list. So they miss social contact. You know, if I think about um, just being able to go to someone to visit a friend and just to give them a hug if they're going through a difficult time. So being together and, and, and just, yeah, just being together is missing. And that is very difficult, especially for our teens. Missing peer support. So peers will often sit together and they will, you know, complain about the parents and complain about the siblings and complain, complain, but at least there's that shared experience. Oh yes, they complain over the phone or whatever. It's once again not the same. Missing out on social events. Um, I've had so many children that just said, you know, I actually cannot believe I'm turning 16 and it's lockdown. Um, I cannot see my friends. It's just, you know, this is a kind of a rite of passage and I need to spend it 
only with my family. It's extremely frustrating. Um, lack of personal space. This is so important because the siblings are around, um, you know, they, there's no space that is just my own. So even if they have their own room, being in the room all the time is also not really the, um, you know, the answer. So it's lack of personal space when everyone is in the same, same house. Um, and I think that many of you can definitely um, uh, identify with that. I saw a patient a, a while ago that had to go sit in a car to have a session because the children wouldn't want to leave her alone. So that's the reality that we're dealing with at this stage. So getting away from family arguments, I think it is so important to know that, you know, going to school, going to visit friends, if the home environment is not, you know, 100% and people are struggling with the interpersonal relationships, it gives everyone a kind of a breathing space to be able to to go away from home kind of let up the emotions whatever they need to do and then come back home and then you're better able to cope with conflict that goes on in in the home so that is very difficult the other one too much focus on schoolwork, and i think as adults we struggle with this as well too much focus on our own work because being locked in that's that's what we can do. We try to be productive and this is a way to be productive. And I think some of the children focus on the schoolwork as well. Um, they need to get everything right. They are nervous about going back to school and not being um, on, on par with uh, their friends. So that also creates a lot of anxiety in our kids. Friendships and intimate relationships. I think we've all been adolescents. We know what it feels like, you know, to be in love and that person is the center of your attention and then all of a sudden nothing. And that is difficult. You actually feel as though your world's going to end. Um, so just missing the friendships, missing those intimate relationships. And then of course, the, the normal things, anxiety and stress, depression, just because we're locked in doesn't mean that our other medical um, difficulties or problems, our mental health issues go away. Actually, it you kind of put a, um, you kind of zoom in on those things, and that can be extremely anxiety provoking. And then something that I think we as parents don't really want to admit: our kids do experiment. So if you, if your children are used to um, using dacha or using other drugs or alcohol or things over the weekends or with their friends, then you know there's a sense of okay, there's no access to this, so I'm being policed and um yeah they, it's unboxed in so i don't have access to all these things and that can also create anxiety and of course have um, medical implications right so now on to the practical stuff um what do we actually do okay so first of all very important don't threaten them and I was reading through the, the theory and the text and all the information that's out there. And I was just thinking, how are you going to follow through on your threats anyway? Um, you know, this is a, a time where they feel boxed in anyway. This is a time where they feel trapped in the specific space. So you threatening them, first of all, how are you going to follow through? And what are you communicating to your child? Think with everything that you do in the relationship with your child you need to decide is this bringing them closer to you or is this pushing them away um, and if your answer is pushing them away then you would kind of have to take a step back and think okay how can I um, how can I rethink the relationship what does my child need so for us it's important more important than ever to build good communication with our teenagers and actually with everyone in the house. So how do we do that? Now, once again, what I'm going to go through is just a few nice practical tips, um, but it's by no means extensive. So if you feel that there are things that work for you or things that you want to share with others, please comment in the, in the chat box. So we need to learn from each other. That's really important. Right, so let's start. So normalize the anxiety. We are all so anxious. Um, I saw a, a child yesterday actually, and it was the first time that he came out of 
his home. So they've been for walks, but this is the first time. And he was so anxious about, you know, wearing the mask. And, you know, if I don't wear a mask, is the police going to lock me up? And, you know, so they have their ideas. They're scared. So we need to normalize for them that, you know, adults are scared. Everyone's scared. Um, they are not alone in this. And check in on, check in on them regularly. Maybe have like a little, um, you know, not event. I don't want to say it you know, checking in in the morning saying, okay, how's everyone doing? And, you know, if anxiety is high, do fun things to help them. We need to help our teenagers and our children to regulate their emotions. It doesn't come naturally. They're still learning. Give them reliable information. Now, this is so important because our kids are online all the time. And if they get access to information that is not true, they're going to be more anxious, more scared. Um, so it's important that you give them the right information. Um, the right information is also not always available to us. And there's lots of false news and all of that. But I think as far as possible, give them the information. Um, the World Health Organization is a good resource. Um, UNICEF is a good resource. So, so help them to, to be able to discern between, you know, what is, what is true and what is probably false and nonsense. Right. Balance online and social media exposure. This is so important because our kids are, like I said, online all the time. They do their schooling, they do their, um, you know, socializing, everything on, online. So it's important not to be rigid and pedantic in this regard. They are going to spend more time online because they're not with their friends, they're not at school. But it's important to have a balance. And, you know, in that breath, it's also important for you to have a balance. You cannot say to them, well, you're not supposed to be online and, you know, you need to go play outside. That You have to practice what you preach, unfortunately. Even though you're also working, you have to model being, playing outside and having fun and baking and whatever you can do with them. So balancing that is important scheduling offline time together so that links with my previous um, point it is so important to put media away to put the electronics away to to have like designated time every day where you do something that's fun create something learn a skill build something and there are wonderful tips on the internet pinterest where you can get nice ideas um it, yeah and especially our occupational therapists, they are just amazing in having these ideas that are not only, um, you know, fun, but also practical and learning together. Okay, home mode versus school mode. This is, I think, one of the most important things that I've seen in, in my practice the past few weeks. It is that people really struggle to switch off. Um, so it might be a good idea to have like a little corner that in the morning when it's time for the school, school time, you kind of maybe put a, a watch there or you put there whatever the child um, feel, feels comfortable with that they want to have as part of the school desk. Um, and then when school is over and it's done, you pack that away. I think we um, often don't realize how going to work and coming back from work kind of it's a routine it sets the, the the stage for the next section or next part of our day and we don't have that if we work or do schooling at home so it's important to set up those stages um, and you can make it creative you can really make it um, make it nice create distractions something to look forward to each week whether it is as you know a special movie, doing something together. So creating distractions and, you know, putting something nice and event, even if it's in the home, is incredibly important to get their motivation up and just, just to have that something that's not just being at home and doing work all the time. Okay, day-to-day -day balance and routine. That's important, getting up at the same time every day, doing the schoolwork same time every day. So not to be rigid, but just to have a little bit of routine. Our children and our teenagers and ourselves actually thrive in routine, even if we don't like it. Um, 
and collaborate on their roles and responsibilities. Make your teenagers part of, um, you know, the setting up of the roster. What would they like to do? What, would, what do they hate to do? What can someone else maybe do? So if they love ironing, then great, that's their job. If they hate washing the dishes, then, you know, they can maybe, um, uh, you know, discuss, you know, and make plans. They're most wonderful at making plans. So, you know, access that creativity. Find new ways of connecting with friends. So I think that is a huge challenge currently. Um, something that was such a sweet idea the other day was someone had a party and the mom had a, a drive drive in party. So I think the idea was that they very responsibly they could pick up a cupcake and a something and then they could just say hi through the window or whatever. It just kind of brings back a little bit of life and creativity. So just new ways of connecting with friends. Allow them to feel their emotions. That's so important. We often tell our children that you're not allowed to feel this. You shouldn't get angry. Please, please give your children the, um, the permission to feel what they are feeling. The difficulty is they must show their feelings appropriately. Okay, so if you're feeling angry, it's not okay to kick the dog but you can go and hit your pillow. And there are wonderful emotion regulation um, techniques online. So please go and, go and Google and go and search. It's something that you can do with your children. It might be an activity, making something that they can punch or whatever. The world is really your oyster at this stage. And now that things are um, not as rigid in terms of what we can buy, we can really get really arty and creative. So something that links with allowing them to feel their feelings is be supportive, but set clear limits. You are still the parent. There still needs to be structure within the environment. Structure really makes us feel safe. So you will still have your limits, your rules, your regulations. Um, I think that maybe something that people do is they feel bad because children cannot see their friends. They cannot go out. So they tend to let just let all the rules go out the window. And I think that that is difficult. So just get your rules together, maybe reassess. We all thought that it would be three weeks lockdown and here we sit almost nine weeks later. So it is a challenge. It's something that you need to redefine all the time and give them space. Now, you know, it is so funny. When I was a teenager, you know, the smaller your headphones could be, the nicer or cooler you were. Now these days, it's like these big things and it's just amazing. It's bigger, bigger than their heads. But anyway, so just the, this just made me think of our teenagers. Oh, there's another set of head, big headphones. Um, thank you, Noah. <laughs> um, okay, sorry, I digress. Okay, so give them space. They need to have this space that's just theirs. You know, space with regards to not, um, you know, being in their emotional space all the time. Trust that your teenager will come and talk to you when they need to. That's extremely important. Okay. Try not to over rely on them. I think many parents obviously work from home. So there's the there's other smaller kids. There's a lot of things that we need to, to handle, take care of, take out of, from our list. And we tend to over rely on our, on our older kids. Um, just check in with them. Just make sure and check on yourself as well that you don't do that too often and all the time. Um, because they can also get overwhelmed if they have to take responsibility for their own school work themselves, their chores, but then also the, the smaller ones while mom and dad has to work. It is incredibly difficult. Um, so we need to, we need just to be mindful of that. And then you cannot do it all. And there's very often not the resources to, you know, take the child to a professional we really have some amazing support lines in South Africa where your child can phone 24 seven. And it's important to empower them to use these services and also for them to know that you won't be angry or disappointed in them if they decide to make use of the support lines. Now that goes back to the 
developmental stage or the, the task of you know using peers and not really wanting to talk to their parents all the time remember when they tell you things it very often comes with a reaction as a parent from your side and they're sometimes very nervous for that reaction so support lines are a wonderful um, resource for them to use so yeah train them in what is out there for them to use right then the most important thing, we will, this is a crappy situation and I think no one will choose to be in lockdown and going through this. And I think no one will choose to, you know, everyone in the home, if you are lucky enough to be working, to work, to manage kids, to homeschool, to et cetera, et cetera. But you will probably never have this time ever again. So as far as possible, as far as your day allows, as far as you are able to manage, also make it fun. Um, and also encourage your children to make it fun and then to encourage your teenagers to be creative and to think of ideas. Um, at the end of the day, you are a team and you want to do this together and you want them to be part of the team and also come with some awesome ideas. So, I just want to leave you with this last quote. Um, well, I could do it for a day, but I wouldn't want to be a teenager again. I really wouldn't. So I think sometimes it is just so um, freeing to put yourself in the other person's shoes, that other person you don't understand, and just kind of backtrack a little bit and think, okay, if I was a teenager, if I was my teen self, what would I feel in this situation? And that often helps us to be more empathic and to, to give our children what they, what they need. Um, yeah, and that is me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doreen. That was great. Um, I really, really enjoyed the, the content and your, your rainbow is great. Your, your presentation is lovely. Um, <laughs> I, so we have a few minutes. We have about 10 minutes. So I'm just wondering if anybody has any questions they'd like. Um, I do see in the chat box, um, there was a reflection around teens not wanting to, to do things with adults. And I just wondered if you had any thoughts around that. I think it was when you were talking specifically about doing things in the house and chores and those types of things so i don't know if you have any reflections around that hmm, i think I, I guess it depends on what they want them to do um there's i think with teenagers there's a lot of bargaining that that has to you know that has to happen so um you know are they not doing it because they're being lazy is it something that they don't feel that they have the skill to do is it something that is boring um so i yeah i think it, it depends on on what it is um and when they are expected to do it i think if it's an unreasonable obviously that's difficult um but getting them to partake you kind of have to entice them and I think something that I didn't mention is that we, we actually do have to give them, give them rewards. So, I mean, we, as, as people, we don't like to do things if it doesn't lead to something. Um, so if they can see what the value of what they're helping with in the household is to, you know, to mom and dad, and it's appropriate, um, for their developmental level. Um, it's kind of, you need to make it practical and you need to, to show them what's, what's in it for them. And I think that is extremely difficult for parents currently because there's only so much that you can entice them with. Um, yeah, I don't know whether anyone else has some, some feedback or some, um, yeah, a biki rot. You're welcome um. to join us. <laughs> And Doreen, I had a question um, if, while we wait for anybody else to pop something in the chat box. Um, I wanted to ask, you spoke about validating feelings and acknowledging that this is difficult. Do you have any suggestions in terms of language that you can use? Because I know with little ones, you could say, I understand you feel frustrated, but I'm just wondering with teens, if you have suggestions of how to go about validating feelings. Hmm. So I think with teens, it sometimes helps to say that, um, yeah, they, they're difficult because they don't necessarily talk. 
So sometimes a, a kind of entry point would be to say, you know, when when I was, a, if I were a teenager, if I think about, you know, me being a teen in this situation, I would actually feel X, Y, and Z. And I'm wondering whether that is some, it might be, it might not be. You can say mom might be completely off the rocker or wrong, but I'm wondering whether you are feeling, you know, disappointed that you cannot see your friends. So it's kind of about putting it out there, but not necessarily saying that, well, this is how you're feeling because I would have felt that way. So it's kind of just checking. So it's almost like if you think about it, nudging, or you may be a little bit disappointed that you cannot see your friends and then they will maybe roll their eyes and say, oh, you know nothing and then just stomp off. But you know, so it's about checking in, but also giving space. So just letting them know you're still there. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Um, oh, Hannah had a question. Thank you, Claire, for letting me know. Um, Hannah, there we go. You're welcome to ask. Oh, it, it, it wasn't uh, really a question. It was just to say thank you and how appropriate uh, your uh, insight into the teens is. I'll have two teens of my own. One is uh, early and one is just entering the middle phase. And um, yes, absolutely right. Uh, they they have been very good. I've been very surprised for two ADHD and one autism kid uh, during the lockdown. They've uh, actually learned a lot. They've learned, my son has learned a lot of baking tips and cooking tips and he feels really proud of himself now and they're able to um, do their online uh, workings. Um, but I, I definitely um, empathize with them about the social contact uh, the the twelve year old hopefully can go back next week to see her friends again. She desperately uh, uh, needs to see her friends again. Um, uh, my oldest is fifteen. Uh, he's on the spectrum, high functioning, but he's okay with not seeing people right now. You know, they they tend mm. to like to be a bit more isolated. But even so, even he needs to uh, uh, reconnect with his friends in his class again. So um, everything you said made perfect sense and was on point uh, and uh, made me feel as if I'm doing okay. <laughs> hmm. And they're doing That's okay. That yeah thank you hannah that is actually beautiful and you know i think that you can also see the growth in them and i'm sure you know it's not easy it's not easy but i'm i'm really happy to hear you know that they're doing well um you know maybe if i can just link to you say that your oldest son you know he's a little bit it, the, the social thing is not such a big thing for him and we see that often i think you know our introverts they are loving this i had an introvert friend that said I've been training my whole life for this. So they're fine, but are more social kids, um, yes. you know, they are really struggling. But I think whether you're introvert or extrovert for our children, it plays a huge part in their social development. And I think um, that's why it would be good if the lockdown is just, um, you know, just made, even if it's just load a little bit so that they can even at least have a, one or two friends over um yeah it's really difficult for them but thanks for sharing thank your you experience. thank you um and then i see we have a question in the chat uh, in the in the chat box from bernice she says i'm a high school teacher and my metrics especially have been struggling with motivation and um the workload feeling a lot more than when they were actually at school how do i as their life orientation teacher and counselor help them to be more motivated Mm. Sure. <laughs> That's a difficult one because I think even our adults, you know, the motivation, you know, goes like this because I think especially the children, they're very externally motivated at this stage. I spoke to a teenager the other day that says, you know what, it's hard for me to do this on my own. Um, I'm much better in a class setting. So I think in a way, maybe if the matrix can go back to work and there's other people and they can, you know, kind of build a, a little community on their own, that, that might definitely help. Um, you know, I'm thinking maybe like charts or maybe checking in, you know, how are we doing today? And just once again, validating that it is difficult, that even grown-ups are struggling with this. And, um, you know, this is something that we've never been through before. So, you know, what, 
what motivates them, um, you know, what are their goals, and maybe kind of to, to check in again. Because like I said previously, we thought this would, was going to be three weeks, and now we're like weeks down the line. And everyone who went like, oh, yeah, we can do this, is kind of like, can we do this? Um, so, yeah, I think it's really important just to reassess and reset your goals. That will probably help for motivation. Okay. Thanks, Doreen. Um, our time is up. So I just wanted to say thank you once again. I think if you have a look in the chat box, everybody who commented really enjoyed your insights. Um, yeah, and just your, your willingness to share with us this morning. So thank you very mm. much. Um, to everybody else, just you can keep a, a check on our social media where we'll talk about our upcoming webinars. Uh, we'll make sure that the video is available on YouTube shortly, shortly and then um, we'll send out a PDF of um, Doreen's talk in a follow-up email. So you can just keep a lookout for that. So you can have that as reference as well. All right. Thanks, everybody. Mm, go ahead, Doreen. Yeah, Tony. No, I just wanted to thank you as well. I think, um, yeah, she's great at managing a colleague's anxiety. And, yeah, I'm very happy to have her as a wing woman this morning. So thank you for everything and setting everything up. I really appreciate it. Oh, that's a pleasure. Thanks, Doreen. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody.